Um, hi, I'm Susan Hall from the Center for Teaching and Learning. It's so nice to see so many of you here, lots of familiar faces and some new faces. Um, so our topic today is um, low stakes slash no stakes assessment. So these are the things um, that don't have lots of points. Sometimes they don't have any points at all. I've got one quick PowerPoint slide I'm going to share before I uh, turn it over to all of our speakers for the day who really have more interesting things to say. So let's see. And there's my slide. Okay, so why bother is really the question. Um, and I think there are four answers. And the first one is for me, the one that's got, you know, in bold and with the asterisk and all that. Answering questions promotes learning. There's just lots of really interesting and um, newly emphasized information from the cognitive psychologists that talk about the role of essentially being quizzed as a way of consolidating what you learn. So I think the best reason to do a lot of low stakes kind of stuff is to give students lots of opportunities to, um, to consolidate what they're learning. The second thing is it can guide our teaching and that's probably more important in an online environment than in a face-to-face -face one. Face-to-face, uh, -face, we're used to, you know, gauging how things are going in the room, looking for the, um, the blank faces and so on. And we just don't have that opportunity as much. The third thing is that even very simple feedback can be useful to learners. So um, you can, you know, use Blackboard quizzes where you uh, just do multiple choice, true, false, machine gradable items so students get their feedback right away. You can do things like polls and surveys where you take a look at it and talk about sort of the group pattern and, and revisit the one or two things that people had difficulty with. So um, I would suggest that you, know, you find things to do that are easy for you. So they're sustainable and you can do it a lot. And then the last thing, and it keeps students on track. There's you know, a fair amount of, um, you know, I think we've all experienced it, and I think there's actually some research on it. Students don't do optional things. Uh, so um, if you want them to read something, it's probably a good idea to ask them some questions about it, have them write a little something, whatever. So that's my little, my quick little intro to what we're gonna be talking about today. So let me stop sharing that if I can find my little, oh, up here, move to the top. Thank you. Okay. Kathy, you're going to introduce our speakers? Well, I am going to turn it over to Terry, who's going to okay. do the introductions, and then I'll take care of the last one. All righty. Terry, you have to look. It's the mic. You got a mic issue over there, sir. Well, it would help if I unmuted myself. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, anyway, our three our three speakers today are going to be Teresa Partridge, um, uh, Lucretia Fraga, and Scott Ditloff. Scott is uh, um, uh, Scott is in the Department of of uh, is it Sociology. Scott, did I get that right? Um, but, uh, well, I know you teach political science and political science. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Teresa is in psychology and Lucretia is uh, from the Department of, of from Education. So we're getting three di uh, perspectives on our topic uh, from people with reaching in three dis different disciplines. And the, uh, we're talking about things like low stakes, uh, as, as, was, as was mentioned, you know, low stakes to just giving really good feedback um, types of opportunities for, for um, uh, uh, assessment. So I'm going to go ahead and um, go turn it over to Teresa. And Teresa, if uh, did you need me to share your PowerPoint? I got your PowerPoint. Did you mean to pull yours up? Uh, you're muted still. Uh, hold on. I'll unmute you. Okay. Okay, go ahead. You're unmuted now. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, I can share it if I have the ability. Do I have that? 
Yes, you should be. I just asked uh, um, Caesar or, or Kathy to make you a co-host. So yes, there you go. Okay, so you can see that okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to put it in full mode, just because, uh, regular presentation mode, because I can't uh, see the rest of the screen when that's happening. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit of just about what I do with low stakes and no stakes, and I'm trying not to overlap with other people. So uh, some of the stuff I just put at the end of my PowerPoint, so you can look at it later. Um, but uh, when I was asked about this, and I actually have a slide similar to um, Susan's having to do with why I do uh, the low stakes assessments now. Um, I don't know about the rest of you. When I went to college, we had maybe four tests and a paper. And our whole grade was based on that. That was it. That was the, the end. So what we, uh, what I first, when I first started at UIW, I kind of had that model a little bit. I had a few quizzes here and there. Um, but then I realized, yeah, that's not working out so great. Partly because of motivation, uh, partly because they're maybe not getting practice with the kind of questions that we're asking. Um, so I started adding in more and more low stakes. And the low stakes adds up to about 15 to 30%, depending on which class I'm, uh, that I have for that. Um, and the same kind of reasons that uh, Susan talked about, talk about the testing effect. Students learn by testing them because they have to be active in their thinking at that point. Um, it hopefully motivates them to review beforehand. Um, and then I also use what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, Kahoot. Uh, as a practice before exams. So these are the kind of things that I do uh, when I think about this. I use Blackboard quizzes uh, from a pool and I have some slides at the end that show how I set it up and I think uh, Scott may have some examples as well. Um, I use it either with the testing pool from the publisher, even though I know that they can get these questions online, but I'm not really interested in that. I'm more interested in just trying to get them practice with it, even if they get full credit. Uh, these things are only worth like five points each out of maybe four to 500 points that they get for the whole semester. Um, so I may do it from a poll, which makes, uh, makes sure that they don't get the same questions necessarily that everybody else in the class gets, or I give them a chance to do a second attempt. I really like these, uh, we have these little cards that Susan had given us. I'll show you I can put this on the camera. So we had these little feedback cards that were immediate feedback and students could scratch off the answers and if they got it right the first time, they see a star and they get full credit. If they do it the second time, they get half credit if they find a star. Students love doing this in class and so I've been trying to think of ways to do this on Blackboard and the best I can come up with is just give them a second attempt. So give them a feedback and a second attempt. Um, another thing I do is application activities, um, which I'm going to give you an example of one of those. And then I also have, when I'm in class, I have extra credit activities uh, where I just ask them at the beginning of class to list, uh, for, for instance, Piaget's four stages. Um, I can't do that as well now because I've been teaching asynchronously, so uh, I've uh, had different extra credit opportunities. So to give you an example of one thing I've done, uh, I teach child development, and at the end of the semester, um, we always watch Breakfast Club. We were lucky that uh, the library was able to rent this so that students could still see it online, um, because that became kind of a concern, but students were able to see it, and they had this worksheet to complete. Um, and in this worksheet, they had to identify what, for instance, their identity status was, which is one of the chapters at the end of the semester, peer status, that's another chapter, um, and also talk about bullying and parenting. But they had to use examples from the, uh, from the movie for the characters to support their answer. So if the stu uh, student said that they met the uh, identity category of uh, identity diffusion, for instance. That's just kind of going with the flow and not really progressing. They would have to provide actual examples. If you've seen Breakfast Club, uh, John Bender is an excellent example of this. He's uh, the one that is causing most of the trouble, but he's not really doing much for uh, to establish his own identity and what he's gonna do in life. Um, so they have to complete this, provide examples, and then we have a group uh, discussion on this, and that's what we did at the end of the semester. We talked uh, together on Zoom, 
and everybody kind of presented their own ideas and examples on why they would place them in those particular categories or peer statuses. So it was an application uh, process. They received 10 points. This particular class had, I think, 580 points total. So it wasn't worth a lot of points, but it's something they enjoy doing and it's making them apply the concepts uh, to something they're actually seeing, examples of what's occurring. Um, so that's one thing that I use besides the uh, quizzes. Another thing that I really like to do is use online trivia games. So uh, I think this was at a Lily conference a few years ago. I learned about Kahoot and I've just been having fun with it ever since. Um, I personally prefer Kahoot because I have yet to figure out um, how to keep from showing them the answers in Poll Everywhere as they're responding. Um, I use Socrative a little bit, but uh, Kahoot's pretty um, easy to use. Uh, it gives them uh, feedback immediately on their phone or tablet on what they, uh, what, if they answered right or wrong. And it shows them how many people in the class also answered uh, right or one of the wrong answers. Uh, at the end, they have this big podium and they give medals to the top three people. Um, so students enjoy this. Teachers use it in high school and middle school, I think, as well. And uh, that doesn't seem to matter. It's the whole game thing. Anything that get, that's a game, they enjoy. So I was going to show you just some of the uh, pieces to get to the Kahoot in case you want to try it out yourself. Um, this is the website. And the website is different than the one that the students go to. The website has create in it that you create the Kahoot. The students are just going to go to kahoot.it. And that's where they're going to see your particular Kahoot uh, activity. Um, so this is a trivia game. I, I have done it in class a lot. This uh, last semester, I was able to do it on Zoom. The only problem uh, I ran into is if students weren't uh, able to see very well because they have a small phone, they may not have seen the questions very well. So that can be a problem. Um, I have also assigned it outside of class students could go in themselves and test themselves and uh, play the game, even though they're not uh, playing against anyone. And they can take as much time as they want when they do it that way. So um, that's a little bit better because there's a time limit otherwise. Okay, so here is uh, like the first page of the website and I tried to point out where the create button is. Um, you will need to have an account. You can get a free account through them. Um, I saw that we seem to have an institutional account at the moment, but I'm not sure how that was set up. Uh, so I've been using a free account for years. You just have to limit the number of characters in a question, which means you may not be able to ask the biggest questions uh, or provide uh, lots of words for your answers. Um, so that's the create, and let me go down just a little bit further. This is my next page. Okay, so when you're creating it, it's all going to need multiple choice questions. What students only see on their phone or tablet, and they can also do it on the computer, is just this red uh, rectangle with the triangle, the blue one with the diamond, the yellow with the circle, and the green with the square. Um, so they have to read the question from your screen. And that's what I mean about it. It's, it's small for them to see it on Zoom, or if they don't have uh, two devices, so like a phone and something else to use, it may be harder for them uh, to play the game. Uh, in this, you can put your question up here. You can set the time limit. I vary the time by 20 seconds to 30 seconds, depending on how long of a question it is. Um, if it's very wordy, I provide 30 questions. If it's pretty short and sweet, then just 20 seconds. Uh, the points that they get are based on how fast they respond and if they get it correct. If uh, they get it correct and they're one of the fastest uh, people in the class, they're gonna get close to 1,000 points. If they take the whole 20 seconds, if they still get it right, they're going to get less points, but uh, still more than the ones that got it wrong, obviously. And then once you set it up, you can tell, uh, you can click on play, and you decide on either teach or assign. Assign is the one where they can go in individually. Teach is the one that you're doing actively with them at that time when you're presenting it. 
this is what they're going to see first. When you first start presenting it, they're going to have join at, and that's the website they need to go to, and the game pin. This information will need to be provided to them if you're doing it offline. If you're doing it online, then you want to do it at the time that you're showing it to them, um, so they're not trying to access it at the wrong time. They can put in any nicknames they want. I don't care if I know their name or not. I don't actually give credit for uh, this. This is just for uh, to help them review. So this is a, a, an example of a question from one of my Kahoot games. And hopefully you all know the answer. And it's green, psychology. Um, and uh, so students will respond, hopefully as fast as they can. At 30 seconds, it automatically breaks off. And then, uh, this is actually gonna be a different question because I went in later to get another screenshot. Um, it'll show how many people answered each and whether they were correct. So the check mark indicates that this one is correct. And students like to see that because they like to see a comparison. Are they the only one in this class that doesn't know it? Or is it, uh, there's a lot of people that were confused on that topic. And it also helps me kind of determine if I need to talk more about it, which I usually do as long as I don't have another question coming up that's going to uh, mess them up. Okay, at the end, you can get a report. There's gonna be a little podium where they have first place, second place, and uh, third place. Um, and then you'll see about how many questions they got right. So in this particular case, I had 10 students playing and it was about 68%, which I find to often be the case. And I often also tell them that, okay, so the top people are only getting about 80%, which means everybody needs to study a little bit more because if this is our average, we want a higher average. Okay, so that is the main thing on that. Um, I'll go ahead and let Scott talk about this because he may have specific details about the uh, test pools and things that he's using. Do you have that, Scott? And there's a question in the chat. It says, do most students complete the no state assessment? Do most of the students, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear very well. Do they? complete the no stakes assessment this one is a no stakes yeah so uh, do sorry. they do it do they oh, do, do it do though it? okay so if it's with the class then yes so if we're having class on zoom or review on zoom then yes i did not have that many people go to it this last uh when i was trying to get them to go to it actually it was the week after we came back so it may have just been that they were overwhelmed with everything at that point uh the one I did at the end of the semester, I did it online with them during class. So um, I don't know that I have a real good um, example of whether they would do it now. If I really, really want them to do it, I would require, I would uh, or provide extra credit because that seems to be easier to get them to do things for extra credit than for real credit in general. <laughs> extra credit sounds exciting for some reason, even though they haven't done any other things. Uh, I requested of them. So if you uh, say, oh, there's a couple of points of extra credit if you do this. And I think that that would motivate them more to complete it. Teresa, I wasn't going to talk about creating the test pools. So if you want to take that, um, knock yourself out, I can certainly go through and show some of the ones I've done in the past. But Okay, I'll just show this, uh, just these slides real quick. Um, I got the test pool for these quizzes from the uh, publisher. Cengage uh, has a pretty intuitive test bank and in how you can uh, pull it from their website and put it onto Blackboard. Not all test banks are all that great, um, but this one was pretty good. For a test bank or a pool, if I want to choose certain questions, uh, I usually have like 20 questions. And you can see up here that this has 66 items. So I would just put a check mark on the ones that I want, and I've already picked like chapter six on this one. And then I can click on submit, and those are gonna show up in my pool. When I create the actual, uh, or when I put it into a module, I go uh, to create the test, I do reuse questions, 
and then there's total questions. This one has five, and you have to change this to the number of questions. Sorry, I should have mentioned this was a question set. Um, you go to reuse question, you click on question set. I couldn't do that because my snippet app would not let me do both at the same time. Um, but there is one that says uh, use questions that you already have. I created a question set from those that I, questions that I had pulled together. And then I'm selecting three out of the five of those. Uh, something that I always have to do, and maybe there's a quick way of doing this, um, but I always have to change the points over here because it usually gives them 10 points and I don't want to give them 10 points. So, um, so that's another thing you have to click on that, change the number and click on submit to get that on there. Uh, so that's the pull. And then I just had a, a slide where also in creating a quiz, if I had like five definitions, I want everybody to know, I want to make sure they remember this stuff then I may not do a poll. I may just do those five questions and then let them take it one, more than one time. You can uh, select multiple attempts and then the number of attempts, two. And then down further on the screen, show test results. After submission, uh, you can give them a score per question. You can also give them feedback. So you could say, yes, great job, or uh, nope, try again. Um, and uh, that just gives them a little bit more of a motivator maybe. Uh, so that's the other two ways that I use the quizzes in uh, Blackboard. And I use quizzes in Blackboard even when uh, we're not teaching online because I find it a good way to make sure they are at least looking at the material a little bit before we get to class. That's all I've got. You hope anyway, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oops. I have a question. Okay. I, I just logged into Kahootka. I hadn't heard about it. And it's got like plus for $5, pro for 10, premium for 15, and get basic for free. You just use the basic model? Yeah, I use the basic. So like I said, you can't use as many um, letters or words um, because the basic limits you. But uh, I find that uh, usually the more intense application questions, I'm asking them one-on-one -on -one, uh, or in class or in review anyway. So really, I'm just trying to get those uh, more basic concepts down during the Kahoot. So you don't want to make it too complex. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions for Teresa? Well, Teresa, thank you very much for sharing with us. Uh, uh, before Scott gets started, I did place a link in the chat window, and that is a link to a test generator that basically, as long as you follow a certain a certain format uh, for answer, creating your test questions and their answers, um, will put the test in a Blackboard format in seconds and it works beautifully. I've shown it to several faculty. In fact, we actually had a session on on that test generator about two or three weeks ago. So uh, check it out. It's uh, it's free and uh, it works great. Um, Scott. Uh, uh, I'm here. There I am. Okay, there you are. You're all unmuted. Well, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you then. Okay. Can I share the screen? Is that, do I have that right? Oh, where did you go? You should, Scott. Just go ahead. Okay. And, yeah. All right. Respond. All right. There we go. Sure. Okay. Very good. All right. <clears throat> um, I do a couple of things, and I've got. Let's see. Make sure I'm at the right one here. I have too many of these things open. Okay. There we go. Oh, no. Is that the right one? Sorry, I've got too many things getting in the way of my, oh, stop. Okay, this must be it. Sorry, there we go. Huh. Anyway, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I tried doing not terribly long ago was to 
like Teresa said, get my students to um, actually read the textbook ahead of time. I know, call me crazy. <clears throat> One of the things that I thought was do a low stakes quiz, make it open book so that the students can go in and do just quick multiple choice uh, quiz, having to at least open their book up and, you know, get the shrink wrap off and, and that sort of thing. So um, this is from my comparative politics class and um, you would go into your typical module and assignments. Oh, and I picked the one that I didn't put the, put any assignment on, that wasn't very smart. All right. There we go. And they click on it. Oh, I'll move that out of the way. And just real simple questions. And it makes it easier for me to have everything add up to 100. So there's a lot of points, but it's literally like 1% of the grade for the semester. All right, so um, if the class has 100 points, you get one point for doing the quiz. All right. Um, <clears throat> and I have had probably 95% participation uh, on this. It's really just to get them to open the book and look at their uh, textbook and see what's in there. Now, this does not mean, however, that they don't go in there, simply look up the answers and ignore the rest of the chapter haven't quite figured out how to get them to actually read through the material, uh, but you know, at least they're opening the book a little bit and uh, I try and pick out questions that will highlight the important topics in that uh, chapter, not just like piddly stuff. Um, <clears throat> I tend to use the uh, test banks that come with the textbook or if I don't like those, I create my own. Um, it's pretty simple um, with uh, multiple choice questions. Uh, but the nice thing is that um, you can, you know, put the key in uh, when you ask, the, when you enter the questions so that it automatically grades it for you. So uh, there's, other than the putting the test up there, not a lot of work on your behalf otherwise gets them you know marginally involved um, with preparing to be prepared for class all right um, <clears throat> and this is particularly difficult for the classes that i teach to get them to uh, get uh, ready because in political science they, ah, we know about politics but I don't teach American politics, so um, I'm going to ask them questions about things that they've probably never heard of. So they really do need to um, get beyond that idea that they can just think that they can wing it. It's like, oh, I'll just, you know, talk about the U.S. Constitution. Well, ours is different. Federalism isn't that common. So um, I really need them to uh, read these things and look at the the terminology, the concepts, because um, they're different or they're applied differently than they are uh, in American politics. Okay, so that is um, one example. And that I can do whether we're teaching on ground or uh, online. This semester, um, I didn't do the, um, multiple choice quizzes from the chapters um, because well, I figured they were going to have to read the chapter anyway. Um, so I wasn't worried about it as much. What I did to get them engaged was, and I've got a couple of examples of it, was to create one is uh, a discussion board. And I will find a question, there we go, uh, I find a question or a, a handful of questions and post it and ask them to respond to it. 
In other words, they have to look through the chapter, uh, digest it a little bit, and then respond to uh, something that I put on there. And you can see some examples of, um, as I scroll down, what they've done. Some students put a lot in, others not so much. I will, uh, or I require them to um, respond to however many questions I have by the middle of the week. So uh, it's ready to go, um, you know, Monday morning at 12.01 a.m. and until midnight on Wednesday, um, they can read and do whatever they want to, but they have to respond to my questions. From Wednesday midnight until Sunday midnight then, they should respond to any questions I might have to their responses or their classmates' responses. It's an attempt to sort of do asynchronous discussion. Um, it's not quite an equivalent, but it's not a bad substitute either. Um, <clears throat> the students will respond and sometimes it's kind of you know cut and paste from the textbook and it's like direct quotes but <clears throat> it gives you a little bit of a sense of if it's actually making sense to them and if the answer is reasonably good i'll go okay they probably get it if it's not then i really have to step in and say okay you're thinking about it in this way, but you know it, it doesn't fit here, or you are limiting yourself, or you know you just don't get it. And it's a little bit like a student asking you a question in class, it's like, "Oh, is it this?" And it's like, "Yes, you have it," or "No, let's step back and and restart on this." Um, <clears throat> so it does a couple of things. It uh, keeps them more or less engaged, at least somewhat, um, <clears throat> and keeps them on track. Secondly, it um, allows you to see whether or not the reading is just going or if they're getting it. And, and that's particularly difficult as um, you know, we said before, you can't see the students' reactions. You can't see the um, nonverbal cues. So there isn't any way of knowing whether or not they're getting it unless they tell you. All right. And they tell me in this instance by writing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, really get two things keep them engaged, and you get a little bit of a sense of, of how they are uh, doing with the material. And I usually give them. Um, you know, one or two points for um, responses. And I say that there is a minimum amount. You should answer all of my questions first off, and then uh, a minimum of three responses to other students. Um, and I encourage them to do more than that by giving them a better grade. I'll, you know, I give them zero to 100, but it's worth one point for the overall semester. All right. I like to make my math easy. Um, and <clears throat> I have done this both when we've taught online and when I've taught on ground classes. Um, it's a fair amount of work to read through all of it, but um, unless they're really lost, your responses aren't too time consuming. Um, but it does require them to read the book, and you can tell if they don't. Um, the last thing that I do, and I'll see if I've got the right, no, that's my quizzes. There we go. <clears throat> I um, don't know how much value this will be to anybody that doesn't have to worry about uh, where things are in the world. But if you do, um, 
I use this website for my students in international relations. You have to know where things are happening um, because that, you know, you know, why Egypt is important is a lot based on where it is. Um, so I have them do map quizzes and you can use this to um, do map quizzes. They, um, you, I tell them that you have to know where all of the countries are in the Western Hemisphere. I will give you a map, you will label them on the map. Um, this allows you to do it electronically. Um, and they have quizzes and you fill them in. And when my students started using this, their scores went up dramatically. They would get on average 65, 70% um, after they started using this, which quizzes them um, and, you know, it'll po pop up a uh, country and then you have to figure out which one it is and type it in um, and it will do it faster and faster and faster. Um, they do much better. Um, <clears throat> so if you're interested in something like this and it's important to what you're doing, if you're doing international business or something like that, um, it, it's great. Uh, it really seems to make a difference for the students. And one last assignment. Oh, pfft. except that's not the assignment I wanted. All right. I don't know if you have used this site, oh goodness gracious, um, use this site or not, but uh, Quizlet is great. Um, I have the students use this to um, get the, um, to define terms. And there are flashcards and uh, tests and matching and, and all sorts of different options and um, sometimes I give them points for it. Other times I just say, these are gonna be on the test, know them. And uh, whatever works for them, um, there are half a dozen different uh, options. And depending on your textbook, you may already have um, these um, flashcards created in Quizlet as they do for this one, or you can make your own and it's pretty simple. Um, and again, that can be used online or um, on ground. It's, it gives them an opportunity to practice. I think that's what I have. There's a question, there's a question in the chat. It says, what are the pros and cons of allowing multiple attempts? Ah, <clears throat> well, in terms of, um, simplicity of um, for you as the instructor if they screw it up the first time or if the internet goes out or something like that um, I always like to at least give the students a couple of chances just because sometimes things blow up and I don't necessarily want to go in at two o'clock in the morning and fix their exam or their quiz um, <clears throat> but um, I also find that sometimes they'll race through the first one thinking, oh, no problem, I can do this. And then they realize that they can't. They go back the second times, some of them, and do it more carefully. That's if the students are that self-directed. That's about the best I can give you on the multiple um, opportunities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions for Scott? Okay, well, Lucretia is waiting in the wings. Um, and we'll get her unmuted. Hi, all. Oh, there you are. 
So I went ahead and I put some information in the chat window. Um, if any of you have ever been to any of my presentations, you know that I usually create a website to give you some information for. And so I'm going to share my screen now and take you directly to that site. Um, feel free to follow along um, if that's what you'd like to do. Or you can bookmark it for later use. So this is a website I created just for this assessment, uh, uh, this presentation for on formative assessments. So if you notice on the website, the first thing it asks you is, what do you hope to get from this session? If you wouldn't mind just typing in the chat, it, typing in that box right there and hitting submit, um, I'd like to hear your responses to what you hope to get from this session alone. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Again, it's in the chat window, the bit.ly, or it's right there on the screen. Feel free to take a moment. And you'll see responses are starting to pop up um, as, as you keep typing. So it looks like we're looking for different ideas, more ideas, innovative ideas, interactive assessments. Awesome. So keep going. I know we've got about 45 to 50 people in the, in the room. So feel free to keep providing your responses. I'll keep hitting refresh and we can see what we come up with. Um, I will also show you the tool that I'm using to create this and um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, higher order thinking, awesome. Online tools, more ideas. So if you scroll down, I have an entire website here that I've created. And if you get to the uh, teaching remotely um, sessions that we did after spring break, um, this is another page on that website that I created um, called assessments. And it has nothing but formative assessments on it. And these are assessments that I've used in my classroom, as well as assessments that I've um, I teach. So if you're not familiar, I am um, Lucretia Fraga and I am in the Dreven School of Education. My area of expertise is in instructional technology. So I show our pre-service teachers how to use technology to teach with. Um, free ideas. Awesome. So everything you're going to see here has a free version or there's a, a freemium, meaning that um, there's a basic version that's free and then there's premium versions that you can uh, purchase for an additional cost but everything you see here is free. So the one thing that we are using here, and somebody help me with the chat, um, if there are more chats that come up. Um, I'll try to go back and forth on those. I, I can help you, Dr. Fraga. Thank you much. All right, um, so you'll see that the very first one is called Answer Garden, and that's what this is. How many of you remember a tool called, um, oh, what was that called? Um, it was a back channel tool and it's, I can't remember, but it's gone now. But Answer Garden has taken that place. And so what I'm going to be showing you today is a variety of tools that you can use for formative assessments. Um, Teresa and Scott have showed us a couple of them. Uh, Kahoot is one that's a very popular tool, um, as well as Quizlet is another one. And I'm going to show you several that are a little bit different and how I use those. And so there is a form of Quizlet Live that's more of a gaming version that I'm going to get to. Um, but I'm going to go through some of these. I'm going to go a little quickly um, so we can get through all of them um, and how they're used. I won't go over Flipgrid. I think we've all heard of Flipgrid before and pull everywhere. So the one that I'm showing you now is called Answer Garden. And if you click on answer guarding, it really is a simple way to get some back channel, some feedback from your students as you are um, doing an online session or even doing a face to face session that this allows students to put in responses to a question that your your topic of what you're um, teaching at the time. And so it's very simple. It's free. You click create an answer garden. Um, you type in whatever it is that you want to type. Um, it gives you some different options here, whether it's just brainstorm, classroom, monitor, or locked. Monitor, re moderator means that you um, get to see all the responses before they get to go live. Um, right now we are in classroom view. That's the response that I chose for this one. Um, and then you also have a length choice. So you can determine how long you want their length, their length of their response to be between 20 and 40 characters. Um, you can require a password if you need to email, there's always a spam filter, and then there's cases. So if you want everything to come in 
capitalized or in lowercase, you can change it. Or if you want them, it to be no change at all, then you can leave it at, at that as well. You'll notice that ours, it changed, oops, that's the wrong one. Ours changed everything to lowercase. So even if you typed in capital letters, it was gonna change it immediately to lowercase. Um, and then you can de determine how long you want that to be seen. So an hour, a day, a week, or it can be hidden. And then you hit create, that's it. Um, and once you do that, it gives you a link to share. I'll just create this. Um, this is my question. And under share, you have a choice of embedding it, and which is what I did in, in the website itself, or you just have a link and you can share that link with your students in a number of ways. So whether you stick it on Blackboard, Canvas, whatever you're using, um, you can just take that link and stick it there. So that was Answer Garden. So I'm gonna head back to the website again, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about Edpuzzle. Um, Edpuzzle is something that um, I shared um, previously, and if you've not heard of Edpuzzle, um, think of it as a way of um, attaining content knowledge from videos that you may be asking your students to watch. So if by chance, and up here at the top of this website, I have an entire site, an entire link on Edpuzzle. Um, and so Edpuzzle is really a nice tool that allows, student, that allows you to get um, information from students. That's my login. Um, and this is my particular site itself. Um, in the School of Ed, we have these Texas Education Agency teacher ethics training that every student has to complete. And so it requires them to watch the video. And as you're watching the video, um, you can answer these, you can put in these questions for them to answer. Um, right now, the full version of Edpuzzle is available free to anybody who uses it. However, that's only right now during COVID. Um, and I think in the fall, that's gonna change. So um, whether we end up moving to that premium version or not, I'm gonna pass that on to Kathy because I've had other faculty ask me about that. Um, and so that's a really nice tool for us to use as well. But Kathy, you can go ahead and answer that question. Sure, so uh, yeah, I, and I had reached out to the, um, to the, uh, the people at Puzzle and then and, and waiting to hear back, but then, when I talked to Lucretia about this, I realized that maybe they had replied it's in my quarantine. So I, I'm on the case. And I'm just gonna do a really quick, short view of this. If you want some more specific information, like I said, there is an entire link here on this website that I provided for you that has some more information about Edpuzzle. So I'm gonna go back here and just show you a small snippet of what that looks like. And so this is one of the TEA videos that they have to watch. And notice there are three little bubbles here of where I got to add a question. Um, and so those questions, as they're watching it, the video stops and it requires them to answer the question here before they can go on. Now this one has a skip version on it, but um, you can remove that. Um, and so they have to answer the question then submit. Once they submit that, then they can keep going. So, um, and of course, then they tell you which one the correct answer is. Um, you have all of the control over how you want that to look um, and what you want it to, um, what you want the video to be. The biggest question I usually get within Edpuzzle is, can I use my own videos? And the answer is yes. So when you click on the content um, to create your own, uh, it gives you the option of uploading your own videos. So if you create, let's say a screencast or a video of, some, of you pr presenting something and you want them to answer, ask, answer questions from what you've given them, you can upload that video on your own and then add those questions in yourself. So short, quick, fast of Edpuzzle. If you have more questions, feel free to contact me and I will be happy to review that specifically for you. I do have a short screencast that I created um, for Edpuzzle that I'm sharing with Susan, and I think they're putting it on the Teacher Remotely webpage. So that's, that's still to come. Um, save a narrated PowerPoint as an MP4 and then smash it into Edpuzzle. And it's, it's great. You're right, Matt, it works very well to do that. So I know Teresa mentioned um, Kahoot. Um, this is another one of those kind of quizzing um, websites that you can use. Um, when students get tired of Kahoot, um, I know within our field, you know, that Kahoot thing comes up and they hear the music, you know, going and all of a sudden you get the, oh, not another Kahoot. 
And so what I found is I try to like to switch it up a little bit. And GimKit is a new, newer version of a similar kind of game, gamified way of answering um, quiz, uh, questions in a formative assessment. And so here are some things that I created um, a while back, and this one's called gamification. And so what's nice about this is that um, when you play, there's two different ways you can play. You can play in classic mode or team mode. Team mode, you create the teams in ahead of time. But it's all about raising money. So for, um, for GimKit, you get to determine how much every player gets to start with what is the handicap and what is their ultimate goal? Okay, are you playing for 10 minutes in time? Are you racing against each other? Is everybody all in? So usually we play for time and at the end of 10 minutes, whoever has the most money wins. Now, how do they gain that money is based upon answering those questions and answering the questions correctly. So the more questions they answer correctly, the more, que the more money they raise. Um, they earn. If they answer the questions incorrectly, then they start losing money. And so this is a pretty easy way of getting them to um, um, review some of, the, some of the questions, or maybe it's a review for a test, um, and it's in a fun way. Um, and so if we play classic mode, everybody would be able to join. You'd go to gimkit.com and answer, enter that code, and then we'd start the game. Well, it's not going to start right now because there's nobody in the in the field. I mean, in the thing, in the game. Um, so, strategies. These are all of the questions that I had to review. We played for ten minutes. Um, it does give you some reports. Here's some games that I played a year ago. Um, none of these students are at UIW anymore, <laughs> and so I can see exactly what questions they got right and what they got wrong. And so that's really a nice way of determining where do I need to go back and reteach. Um, so it's a, it's a nice way of looking at that. So it's just an alternative to um, Kahoot and playing in another way to review for quizzes or for other um, kinds of um, review. So you've got, you know, you can look at the questions that they've answered quick, correctly or incorrectly and what their accuracy were. So for this particular game, I had an 81% accuracy. That tells me that they're making about a B on this quiz that I'm about to give, okay? Uh, questions about GimKit. The link is here. Feel free to bookmark this site and you can always go back to it as well. I'm just gonna hint on um, the, um, that you can create quizzes in Google Forms as well as Microsoft Forms. There is now an entire template that they provide you already that you can make any form, any Google Form, um, a quiz as well. Um, there's a link directly there that'll take you there. This is one of the new favorite ones that I've started using as we've been teaching online. If you're not familiar with Google Jamboard, um, it is a whiteboard. And if you have a Google account or your students have a Google account, it gives everybody the ability to create a whiteboard. And so what I've done is I've created this as a participatory way to make sure my students are engaged in what I'm doing online. And so for example, if I ask, um, we're talking about, I don't know, I'm trying to think in learning theories. Let's say we're talking about Vygotsky or Piaget, whomever it may be, and I ask a question, I will ask them to write their answer on, um, on the, I don't even know what I'm writing. Let's say the answer is three. I'm gonna ask them to write this. And what's nice about Zoom is that multiple people can share their screens. And so what I can say is, write the response to this question and then share your screen and then everybody gets to see the response. Or I can ask them to, you know, create a variety of things using this Jamboard and it's a way to encourage or to find an image, find a picture that demonstrates, um, you know, social constructivism, find an image that demonstrates, you know, whatever the concept is. And so I can, I can see that, um, from them sharing their image. I can create a background as well, and maybe it's, um, maybe we want them to post, um, um, solve an equation. And so let's say it's seven plus, oops, wrong one. I need this one. Seven plus three and one times six equals. Okay, and so now they have to do that themselves. So this 
virtual whiteboard, which is called Jamboard, is a really nice way to get them to respond. And I wrote all of that. I didn't need a pencil. I didn't anything. I just used my mouse. Um, so it's another way of getting students some feedback from students um, where you would maybe be able to um, see, as uh, Susan mentioned earlier, sometimes you should be able to see when, when students are looking confused. Um, this is another way to help you gauge their understanding of the content as you're teaching, especially in an online environment. Um, okay, let's see. I'm going to head back to that website again, and you'll see I've got a bazillion windows open here. Um, but we'll get through this. Flipgrid, we've done a lot with Flipgrid. Again, I've got a link up here on my website that talks more about Flipgrid. And I know that um, Caesar does a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions for people with Flipgrid. So feel free to uh, hit up Caesar. He's always looking for business. So here's one of the newest ones that, um, that I have found. I, I can say I've not used, but I've seen the most promise from and it's called Note. And if you're not familiar, Note is a way to take, to allow students to take their notes or for you to take your notes and turn them automatically into a quiz. So it's like, wait a minute, what did that, just, what happened there? Right, so it's, it's a little mind boggling. I will say I've not used this, but this is one that I plan on looking further into this semester, uh, for the fall semester. And so it'll import things from your Google Drive. It can go from your handwritten notes. Students can use it to quiz themselves, but you can also use it to create quizzes for students. So let's say um, you are, um, have a quiz for history. I guess this is for history. And you've got certain notes. Well, it'll immediately take those notes and then work them into questions about, um, I'm looking for the example. Um, about whatever it is you wrote. So you don't have to create the question anymore. They are taking your notes and creating the question for you. And let me figure out where the, my bad. So it's all based upon algorithms, of course. Um, you can do a number of things um, with note. Um, and so I can take any set of notes put it within the app itself, and then it'll turn it into a question, into different questions. So like I said, I've not specifically used this yet, but I wanted to share it with you because it has so much promise to it. And I've heard so many people in all of my um, professional learning groups, networks, have used, that are using Note um, during this time. Um, and so again, you can import your documents and it automatically creates a quiz from it. And so here's um, the example. So here's the notes themselves. And then once you put it in there and you hit quiz, it turns those into a quiz themselves. Um, amazing. I think it um, can have several uses. There's also a dashboard for teachers to get, um, to assign the quiz itself um, and then get information, um, some formative assessment from that as well, especially if it's you know, for an upcoming test or something like that. Can it link to OneNote? That's a good question. That I'm not sure, um, but we can find out. There's usually an FAQ. Hmm. I'm not seeing anything about OneNote. Nope, nothing about OneNote. Um, but it's a good, good, good question. And I will say they do have, you know, a Windows version. So I can't imagine why it would not go from one to the other. But I will say it will go directly from Word. So if you take your OneNote, put it in a Word document, then it can go directly into it as well. So again, Note um, has great promise. I hope in the fall I have some better examples to show you of something that I've created myself um, using Note. Um, but that is my homework for this summer. Uh, Plickers, how many of you ever heard of Plickers? So Plickers requires you to actually download a, um, download these free documents. Um, and they look like that. They're just of these sites. And so what I've done in a virtual setting is that I have assigned each one of these to a student and Plickers then has an app. And when you scan the app with your phone, over it, it tells you 
exactly who got the answer, the, um, the question right and who got it wrong. Um, and it's a very quick way. And so what I will do is for students in an online format, especially if we're in Zoom, I'll ask them to hold up their, their piece of paper that has that code on it, you know, so that then I can scan it and I, it'll determine exactly, whoop, it'll determine exactly um, who's got the answer and who doesn't. So Plickers is another one of those quick kind of polling tools that allows you to get some answers uh, quickly on whatever it is that you're teaching. Uh, poll everywhere. We've seen that before. Uh, poll Daddy is very similar um, in that it used to be Poll Daddy. It's now called Crowd Signal. Um, it gives you a way of creating those polls during your class that you can bring in and get some of the same kind of data that you would um, if you used a poll everywhere. Just a different option um, to use. Um, Quizlet Live. So I know we saw um, Scott talk about Quizlet. But Quizlet Live is taking that quiz and making it into a game. And so the first thing you would have to do is create the actual quiz, the questions themselves. Um, and then once you do that, it, um, you can pick any of the Quizlets that you may already have. And then you share the code with your students. The students are then put into teams. It's pre-assigned teams. Um, and then they have to ask questions. Now, the thing about this is that um, they have to be able to talk to each other within a group setting. Um, so the teams usually sit together and then they start playing. So in an online version, this could be, um, this would be done individually. You wouldn't be able to do this per team. You would do this individually. Um, and then they race against each other um, and they figure out who can do best. So it's another one of those kind of Kahoot, Gim kit kind of games that you can play, but Quizlet Live is a portion of Quizlet that allows you to take the uh, flashcards that you've created within Quizlet and make it a game. All right, so the last one I'm gonna show is quizzes. And again, that's another polling software um, that allows you to engage your students um, in different kinds of formative assessments. All different tools that you can use for distance learning, um, and for formative assessment in whatever content area that you may teach. Um, and then the last thing what I put here was 10 useful approaches for formative assessment. And these are some things that we do typically in a face-to-face um, -face setting that um, has some ways, if we um, think about these tools that I just went over, ways that you can do that in a virtual setting as well. Um, this is a link. If you click on that link, it'll take you directly to this document on 10 innovative uh, formative assessment examples for teachers to know. Um, and it gives you a lot of good information here and ways that you can uh, implement those. Um, I always link to Kathy Schrock. If you're not familiar with Kathy Schrock, she has an entire website on rubrics and how we can assess some of these formative things um, whether it's a three minute summary or things like that, that are low stakes. Obviously, if it's low stakes, then we don't necessarily need to, um, um, we don't need to um, really grade it. Um, I do, what I do, and to answer some of the questions that were coming up in the Zoom about how do we ensure that students do these things, I usually stick a participation grade on it of some sort, um, whether it's a complete or not complete, that kind of thing, um, to show that they've done it. Um, in Edpuzzle, when we do the TEA modules, they have to do those so they know that that is a completely graded assignment. So um, that's what I have to share for with you today. I hope you've gotten at least one or two new tools that you may be able to try out um, during this summer, um, during this time um, that we have to prepare for the unknown. <laughs> so thank you very much, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. There's one in the chat It says, can we use these polling websites for asynchronous class? For asynchronous classes? So the way I've done that in the past is um, I just leave the poll open. So it's almost like a Padlet wall and I didn't put that on there, but you could um, leave the poll open and as people respond, um, you know, they may have a, a, wi a window of a week to answer the question and then the poll will come in and respond to that. What I've seen people do in the past is that they'll ask a question, and then once the um, once the poll is complete, at the then there's a question that comes up and says, based upon the data collected, 
you know, how would you, and then fill in the blank, then they have to respond to that in some kind of written format. So it's an overall way of collecting data and then asking them to analyze data based upon the responses that were given. So um, in an asynchronous way. Thank you. Any other questions? I did want to point out real quick that we do have a site license um, for Poll Everywhere. We do have a site license for Padlet and we have a site license for uh, Flipgrid. So all three of those are, are that we have licensing for. So you don't have to sign up for any account. You don't have to sign up for a free account. Uh, Caesar and I can provide details how to access that information. Um, so if you wanted to use any of those, it's not something we actually have to to go out and uh, locate, uh, go out and sign up for. I'm gonna go ahead and stick the website, that website link back into the chat again, just in case you miss that, um, just so you can get to it. Um, but it's still the same um, site. Um, there's several tabs that you can get other information from. Well, thank you, Lucretia and Scott and Teresa for uh, talking to us today. Um, I'm going to close this out since Kathy had to leave for another meeting. But uh, again, thank you so much. If you have any questions, um, um, uh, you can go ahead and ask them or put them in the chat or just send Caesar or myself uh, or Dr. Fraga uh, an email. Um, Dr. Fraga, could you put your email into the chat as well? Sure thing. And ours are in there as well. Hi, I have a question. Yes. Um, I tried to chat and I typed in several times and what I wrote never appeared. So I obviously didn't know what I was doing. Okay. Make sure it's going to everyone and not just to one person. I did that, but do you click enter or do you do something else? Yes, you click enter. Okay. Um, press your enter key, it'll be fine. So one of, Adela is asking about the number of screens that can be shared simultaneously. So what I found is none of my classes were more than um, 15 students and they were all able to share at the same time. So I think that's something, and I know that if you're not, if you're in gallery view in Zoom, you can see up to 50 windows on the screen and I think for as many windows that you can see on the screen, that's as many as that can be shared. Um, but that's a good question. I've not tried anything more than 15. So we did have 15 that were able to share it all at one time. You're welcome. Well, we're, uh, we're at 10 minutes after three, so we'll go ahead and uh, Caesar, I think you're the, or Adela since you're up, set up as host today. Um, uh, again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for presenting and sharing your information with us. It's, uh, we really uh, appreciate the extra help that we can get um, from, um, from a faculty because, you know, when faculty and their colleagues get together, they can get a lot of information and a lot of buy-in and a lot of opportunities to learn from each other. So we thank you for taking the time to, to join us and share that information with us. Thank you. Well, you guys have a wonderful You're welcome. day. Yeah, guys have a wonderful day and enjoy the weekend. Mm -hmm. Evidently the bars are opening this weekend. <laughs> Not going near them. <laughs> <laughs>